This is the OGM weekly call on Thursday, October 5th, 2023. Fall is arriving and uh, we are on our way into a new season. Um, I think it's time for a check-in format call. We haven't done check-ins for a while. Uh, it would be lovely to figure out what we're up to and where we are. Uh, our normal, our check-in format is usually one that kind of uh, runs itself, meaning I don't uh, intermediate, I don't step in that much, except to explain to people coming into the call who might not know what's going on, uh, or when things don't follow plan. But um, raise your raise your electronic Zoom hand in order to take a turn. Uh, take your time stepping into the conversation. Uh, you can either share a topic that's worth all of our spending our time together on or what OGME things in your life are uh, are going on right now. And uh, then when you're done, uh, I will not pass to the next person. The next person can just unmute and then step in. And, and small detail, if you lower your hand, you disappear from the upper corner and you fall into the crowd again. Uh, so... Um, that's interesting. I just got an allow, allow recording request, uh, which normally doesn't happen. Normally, these Fathom recorders do their thing and step in automatically. Uh, and so we will we will sort of head off into uh, check-ins that way. And then when we're please only check in one time. Uh, don't don't start a conversation from the check-ins. Take notes. Feel free to take notes in the chat or to ask questions in the chat or whatever. And then when we're all done checking in we will head into a conversation around whatever seemed to be uh, hottest for us or juiciest for us in the check-in round. And uh, with that, I will go quiet and whoever would like to check in first, either start talking or raise your hand and then jump in. And uh, the when we raise our hands, Zoom remembers those hands raised in order. So that order will work just fine as the cue for who is to go next. Hey, Ken. Hey, Pete. We're uh, just starting a check-in round, so I'm going to go quiet and <clears throat> let people uh, jump in as they wish. Well, I'll jump in since I haven't been here for a while. Um, I've been busy with my nonprofit activity, and what I'm finding interesting and starting to do a little research on is changing patterns of volunteerism. It seems as though every nonprofit I'm working with is having board members retire and not so easily finding new ones. And I'm uneasy about that in terms of a lot of the good work that's being done in various areas. So that's sort of my topic of uh, increased understanding at the moment. <laughs> and uh, other than that, life is good. I was in Kansas City for the weekend visiting with my daughter and son-in-law who had come up there from Houston she came up because she'd forgotten to renew her driver's license. <laughs> and unfortunately her car was well, car registration and her car sits in Kansas city because they don't want to pay for parking in Houston. So she sure. needed to renew that. So that's part of the reason that they were up, but she hadn't realized it was immediate. So it took part of our weekend to deal with that. A bit of family trivia. Um, but I guess what I'm really interested in, in terms of volunteerism is what we can do to enlist and engage additional people. I learned in my readings that the US actually has the highest level of volunteerism in the world, which I did not know. Um, and there's some interesting papers coming out of the UK and other places on global volunteerism, but I just thought it was, it's kind of on my mind. So I thought I'd share it. That's enough for me. <laughs> Well, let me uh, go next, because I also haven't been uh, in the group for a long time. I spent uh, 
a couple of very nice weeks on vacation in Portugal. And uh, before that, and especially since coming back, I've been uh, working towards uh, three different activities. Uh, two of them I've mentioned here before, so I'll just mention them briefly. Uh, the third one is the most recent that's coming up this coming uh, coming Saturday with a colleague uh, at the World uh, Federation of Future Studies. We're host, co-hosting a uh, webinar about science fiction, uh, books that have been made into science fiction films. Uh, we're going to do uh, a number of coupled books and films looking at questions like... Uh, uh, how does popular culture uh, uh, influence and affect how societies uh, uh, function and what people in societies uh, believe in? And secondly, uh, uh, what makes a book good and what makes a film good? Uh, second of the activities is coming up uh on the ninth on the 12th and the 19th of october with a number of colleagues uh, we're hosting uh, two prototype sessions of intergenerational uh dialogue uh we're putting uh people over 60 years old together in uh small groups with uh, people who are 16 to 18 years old uh, skipping the intermediate generations and uh, hoping to ignite conversations between society's elders, as we're calling them, and some of society's young people. Uh, and uh, if they are both successful, we are hoping to extend it to more prototypes later in the autumn and winter. And in the first two prototypes, the 12th and the 19th, we'll have uh, young people and elders from the UK, from India, and from Nigeria. And the third thing I'm working on is coming up on the 25th of uh, October at the 50th anniversary conference of the uh, World Federation of Future Studies. I'll be co-hosting a workshop which will attempt to give people a lived experience of democracy in 2073 by first giving them a lived experience of democracy in 1973, 50 years before today, then moving them today, and then moving them uh, uh, to 50 years in the future. Uh, what happened to our dreams of democracy 50 years ago? Did they come out or have they changed? What dreams of democracy do we have now for the next decades? And uh, what do you think will be emerging? So uh, three interesting topics, uh, possibly time zone challenging for people on this call, but we will uh, be moving them into uh, other time zones after this. So that's the end of my check in. Check in, yeah. Who is gone and not gone? Is there a roster or is there a list I'm missing somewhere? Uh, okay. You didn't. You didn't. You didn't miss much. Um, only a couple <clears throat> people have gone so far: Judy and Hank. And feel free to jump in. Okay. Um, you know, I've been working locally. I, I work on neighborhood economics, which is <clears throat> we gather the people repairing local economies. We're doing that in San Antonio, and it's national, but uh, focused locally. But locally. I've been working on river rights, and it's pretty interesting. I was part of this coalition of uh, really strong environmental groups trying to get a plastic bag and styrofoam uh, ban. And we got a resolution in our town, Black Mountain, and one in uh, Woodfin. There was actually a, an ordinance, and the county was about to do it. And um, 
a lot of uh, enthusiasm and, you know, folks with, it's really neat to be part of a well-run coalition of volunteers, but they're paid, you know, in by their nonprofits. So it's National Resource Defense Fund, uh, Mountain True, um, the local version of the region of the Sierra Club and Southern Environmental Law Center. And just when all those things got passed, <clears throat> our legislature passed a ban that you it, that they stuck into the budget that came out of conference, so nobody could see it. That banned those things, and like anything else, you can't. There may not be legal to have recycling cans anymore. Uh, and uh, so the um, they were saying, "Oh my God, what are we going to do?" There, and you know, there's, we have a super majority because of. Uh, uh, federally uh, uh, agreed upon gerrymandering in our state <clears throat> it created a Republican supermajority when they count for about 40% of the population. And so they're open to new uh, legal ideas. They were tossing around common lawsuits and stuff. And so I've talked to them about the rights of the river. And so we've gotten the Southern Environmental Law folks to look at it and the Mountain True to look at it. And um, the folks with the, the Buncom or, or the French Broad Coalition to look at it. And we, we're drafting an ordinance, a bill of rights for the town of Black Mountain that says you can't pollute here. And we're giving the rights of nature to the Swannanoa River. So we're in the middle of, of drafting that. And we got some volunteers and stuff. And the, the, the weird thing is, uh, rights of nature seems to be one of the only things that can be a legal equivalent to um, <clears throat> corporate personhood. And uh, this strategy is, is really similar. There's a really good profile of Thurgood Marshall in the New Yorker. And uh, before, you know, all these big uh, things, he, he had 11 different court wins before the Supreme Court, incrementally changing things. And the woman who led the uh, LGBT legal marriage also did lots of small wins in small places. You know, they. They, it was the landscape and mindset shifts, you know, town by town uh, when you do these things. And uh, the same thing was true of uh, women's suffrage. They started in like one town where it was legal and everybody thought it was terrible. And then they went to, some, so it's this incremental strategy uh, to change the mindset. So it's, it's, it's pretty interesting to be part of It's, you know, it's a long game, but, you know, so was voting rights. So, uh, that's kind of fun to, to do. And then the, the other thing, um, well, it's just, you know, people are, are realizing that doing, investing locally makes more sense. And uh, so I'm getting some big dogs saying, hey, we want to think about this thing you're doing. And I'm meeting with some of these big funds at SOCAP. And I says, you know, really, we need to be tied into, we it, it, this one big fund, and I'll go for it's called the reinvestment fund, multi billion dollar CDFI. <clears throat> and they realized that they did one thing locally in New Jersey around food systems. And, and when by doing that, they could get around their own regulations to do things interdisciplinarily. So they could link health and housing and food in a way that they couldn't when they looked at the big issues. And so when they look at a place, they can they are somehow they're able to move their dollars around to everybody. It's really kind of a cool thing. So we're in that space where they want to do that. So that's kind of cool. Maybe we can take advantage of it. So that's it for us. Thanks. Yeah. And if anybody wants to be part of the rights of nature thing, it's a pretty interesting thing. And he will work with you to do a local ordinance that, uh, that can be part of this group of about 20 cities and towns that have done that. So. Yeah, I have been gone for a while. I just came back from a road scholar trip to uh, Chile and Argentina, which was amazing. Um, because what's called it really moves you behind the scene talking with uh, with uh, really insightful local people. And my impression was that Chile is still traumatized by this Pinochet era. Um, everyone uh, in every conversation that came up and, and uh, it must have just been horrendous. And 
and then the, the Friedman came up over and over. You know, this economic theory that they're trying they're trying to push down this road. And I'm thinking any economic theory that has to kill a bunch of people to get implemented is probably not not the ideal economic system. And uh, Argentina is just going through an election. Completely surprised me compared to the image that Argentina has in the international financial markets and what you hear about them and so on. And what you see in reality is, is you know, just completely different in any case. But I wrote that it's just stunning. You know, the, uh, the sort of waterfalls and, and the mountain ranges there. So it, it was it was uh, it was wonderful. Yeah, then coming back, <clears throat> I released, uh, I, I, I wrote uh, the piece with Chad uh, GPT on water because the political discussions in Washington are already uh, being loaded against anything climate change related. So the, or the um, agricultural committees in the House, which are now Republican dominated, refuse to allow any bill to pass through that has climate change references. I mean, it's just uh, insanity on steroids. Um, so my um, my point for writing this was basically, let's change the conversation and talk about water because uh, they're completely unprepared for that. And it resonates widely with uh, with a lot of people who you now got washed out and, and uh, got into flooding and what have you. But to my surprise, I released this you know, in the Sierra Club in Climate Reality Project, and I have a, a mailing list that covers you know, almost 3,000 uh, NGOs, small and large. Um, the feedback, particularly out of the Sierra Club, was really a, a, a surprising, right? Because um, particularly the, the leader from the California chapter, Jan, <clears throat> was very adamant that she hated hated my paper. She hated it, you know, and and come came up with um, a, a number of books and articles, you know, that showed we all know this stuff, you know, and and the way you have written it is so cold and so uh, um, removed from from the emotional content of what this ought to be. And I couldn't figure out what she was talking about now. But uh, making a long story short, what came out is that she is talking in the green spectrum. You know, we, we are just uh, uh, going through this uh, 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 neo book where you know, we, we mean are late in uh, spiral dynamics as a um, as an as a an algorithm, so to speak, right? To to speak in in color, right? To speak in language, and so. What occurred to me is that ChatGPT writes in bright orange, um, and I didn't even recognize this as an orange language. Um, and because I'm like I'm thinking, let's let's you know um, go at this from a yellow perspective, so you reach all the colors. And it turns out that just doesn't work. It just simply doesn't work because you have to customize the language uh, uniquely to your audience. So uh, I released this. Uh, Spiral Dynamics paper to or uh, article there to uh, the Sierra Club, and we got into a really interesting discussion because it's like, uh, oh my God, you know the the uh, uh, it it truly resonates with people to understand that they are there are there is a group of folks operating in red, you know, and this paper on water, but it got it got the green spectrum upset. But the red and blue spectrum wouldn't even read it because it would just bounce off on them. And so you have to, you know, you have to really think about customizations of these uh, of these papers um, or of this kind of information that uh, that that penetrates. You know that because you you're really changing vocabulary, you're changing idiomatic expressions. You know, in idioms and in uh, um, metaphors. Uh, so that's that's uh, turns out to be very interesting. But then you have to think about you know Cambridge Analytica, for example. That's what they are doing, right? I mean, they're using spiral dynamics for their social media uh, work. And so it's really, I think, it's really a good idea to to spend a little bit more time on on that aspect. And the other thing that came out which uh, 
surprised me. I mean, I was just putting that in for political language. But then it turns out that apparently the climate models just sort of missed water, you know, as a factor in in a changing climate um, and uh, focused almost exclusively on carbon. Um, and that has created, you know, a, a, a directional issue you know, where the, I mean, you, you're not going to solve this with electric cars, obviously. Uh, and the lack of focus on agriculture, for example, and on land use in general, uh, is just really, uh, it's just really uh, scary, you know, because uh, land use, partly, you know, people talk about it, but to see the enormous impact it has on the, on the overall climate, on water cycles, because roughly what happens is when you dry out the soil with chemicals, you know, it loses its capacity to absorb and hold on to water. When that happens, then you don't have this evaporation process taking place that uh, that, that generates about forty to sixty percent of local rains. Now, so you you're creating a dry zone. A dry zone is heating up and actually repels clouds, and so so it it, it creates droughts. And then when clouds finally move in, because you have a storm system coming through, the air is hot above this this dry region, meaning it can hold more water, which in then dumps right. So this is in a nutshell. Uh, the, the 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 process like California for example you know with these enormous rainfalls and floods and then you now you have six months of drought you know? but it's going across I mean there's I think there are like uh, thirty two million acres of uh, corn under production I mean they're, they're just enormous uh, fields you know, that have been completely tried out so in any case um, um, how to now translate this you now water story so that people can process it in their own language, you know, in, in their own reference points, um, is is going to be is going to be uh, a good challenge. Um, then I was listening to Schmachtenberger, you know, Kevin, uh, Ken put out this uh, uh, this video from his latest talk, and I also listened to the latest Al Gore story, and here you have. Um, you know, people, thought leaders like this talk about yeah, we're screwed, you know. And so he has this big audience, and and he's telling them, you know, at some length, you know, that uh, we're ending an era of humanity. And what totally freaked me out is when he, you know, stopped at, uh, you know, an extended uh, 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 speech there. People started clapping. Yeah, you know, it was, it's so exciting. This is great stuff you're talking about. And I'm going, he just told you, you know, you're going to die or something. Your civilization is going to collapse. And you think this is like, uh, so people just don't process, you know, it just doesn't sink in uh, from a, from a, uh, on an emotional uh, level there. So, um, yeah, and then th I'm thinking I should think less about all this stuff because it's uh, mostly disturbing. Yeah, so anyway. Well, I will jump in, Jerry. Thanks. Uh, and that's great to see everybody. It's been a little while. Um, 
just got back from uh, exploring the beach down in North Carolina. And Klaus, you're right, man, it's hot down there. Kind of shocking how uh, how uh, what's happened in the last few months. Um, I guess, the, I mean, my biggest update really is around this uh, open source ecosystem stuff from the NSF. And Pete, thanks for putting that in the Plex side. That's, that's such great work. And I do feel like it touches a little bit on stuff that Kevin's doing and Klaus is doing a little bit. The uh, notion being that uh, if we're going to do landscape regeneration, we need a large uh, uh, set of intellectual capital, if you will, um, that's reusable. I think Klaus, the book probably falls into this category. Um, it's reusable, it's, it's, it's malleable, it, it's growable, improvable, you know. And so we basically need an open source ecosystem. And NSF is investing in open source ecosystems. So we ought to capture as much of this money as we possibly can to grow the open source ecosystem that's going to, we're going to use for uh, landscape regeneration. Um, and so we did around this last year, we just finished in September, uh, where we just kind of engaged with people who are interested in this project and have, have open source things that they're developing that are related in some sense to regeneration. And we got uh, six or seven proposals to go in I don't know if anybody will get funded or not, but just the notion that there's a bunch of people out there who are doing work in the space that could be kind of co-investing, if you will, um, seems positive to me. So we'll keep doing another round for uh, 2024, um, try to get some more proposals in. And in the meantime, I'm gonna try to, you know, just kind of create some notional structure for what this ecosystem starts to look like. And so, you know, for example, I think there's a big piece which is around soil quality. There's another big piece which is around hydro hydrology modeling, another piece around um, forms of exchange, whether it's whether it's, you know, it's it's barter or Bitcoin. Um, <clears throat> and these are the, you know, the stack that we're that we're gradually growing that will enable us to be much more adept at change. Um, and I was going to highlight, there's one book that I've been reading that just got me really excited. I don't know if anybody else has run into this one by Dorn Cox, the guy that's done um, um, open the Pharma West stuff, an open team. And he's written a book uh, on open source stuff for agriculture. And it's like, it's the, the book I'm glad I didn't have to write kind of, it's really good. Um, I'll stick the, I'll stick a link in the chat, but uh, so anyway, some of the some of the intellectual framework is out there and in, in pretty good shape, and uh, now it's kind of getting to the details. Well, I can uh, I can go. Buongiorno. I'm studying Italian. I'm going to Italy in two weeks. Um, my wife and I are doing one Pimsleur lesson a day. Um, and I got to say, the Pimsleur course is really, really good. Um, it's set up very much the way we learn language. You don't attempt to read anything. You just listen and repeat and listen and repeat before you ever get into the learning. And it's set up so that um, if you get 80% of the lesson, then that's enough and it keeps reinforcing over time so even though i had a couple of lessons i actually feel like i'm learning a language far better than i ever managed with my high school spanish for example um we're leaving two weeks from today so this uh, i have one more call after this and i'll be gone for a couple weeks and i'm pretty excited uh we're gonna visit tuscany uh for about two and a half weeks and um it's been a chore to get uh, train tickets and accommodations, but that is all handled now. I have tickets to go see uh, David in um, Michelangelo's David in in Florence. It's just I'm really really psyched. Um, Klaus, I had a very different take when people were applauding for Daniel. I thought that they were applauding because finally somebody had named what they knew and was saying this is what's going on. I didn't think it was a celebration of, oh my goodness, we're coming into history. It's like, thank you. Somebody is actually speaking this stuff in a way that, you know, but that's just, that's how I interpret it. You know, it's, it's all open to interpretation. So um, I just, um, I, I appreciated what he said about allow yourself to get depressed. Um, I think we need, uh, we need to be looking with clear eyes at what's going on. And it is really depressing. It's, it's actually, can take us to the edge of despair or even tumble us into the abyss of despair. And that's why I think we need, uh, we need people versed in how to handle despair to help people go through the eye of that needle. Cause it's really going to be challenging, but, um, denial doesn't work. And, and, um, 
so you know that's that's a whole nother ball of wax of of how to do that um but yeah I, right now mostly i'm just focused on i'm I'm putting the problems of the world aside so i can go and enjoy a few weeks in italy <laughs> you know like I, i've spent so much time thinking about all the challenges in the world and i just i just need a little break so that's where i am um and that's where i'll be for a little while Well, several things I've been thinking about. One is uh, that the nation state is too small to deal with climate change, but civilizations might be the real right size uh, because civilizations run on emotional energy where states run on uh, a different kind of specious logic. Along with that, I've been thinking of uh, poetry, like uh, when Dante says, midway the course of this life, I found myself lost in a dark wood. It's that kind of language that I think we need. And people like us need to be writing even bad poetry much more than we do, uh, because it'll surface the words that really count. So that's my check-in. Um, Kevin, I think we'll step in once we've all checked in. So Carl, whenever you feel like it, I think, uh, let's skip past Kevin's hand for a moment. Yeah, so I'm kind of, uh, disorganized today, as you could probably tell with going in and out and now I'm on my laptop, um, and things working on getting head movers here and the part two of moving in under the same roof is still as painful as moving to other locations. Um, I have, um, yeah, well, I'll be out next week myself too. There's a M enabling conference here in DC, which is about the assist assistive technology. So that's uh, what I focus on in my um, in my work and things um, and then they'll be the main interagency government interagency thing November 7th, 8th and 9th which will be in person for the first time in four years <laughs> it'd be nice to see some people in person again for both of those events uh, I've been getting, I don't know if you're getting and or heard of them yet but there's a Voters of Tomorrow group that's out there. I've been getting deluged with emails from a 16-year-old chief of staff. So they're, um, it's like Gen Z is awakening. <laughs> it's like, um, so that's an encur encouraging thing. And then um, I also have run across, there's a resilient cities network. Uh, so there's all, there's, a whole network of cities that have chief resilience officers and things. So, uh, um, kind of the, I guess I'm kind of been going the opposite direction of Doug there. It's looking at the, the networking cities and stuff. That's really where our divide is between urban and rural. Um, there's a guy from Princeton University, he did a Purple America map i don't know if you've seen those but it's just like by county and and things in the um red versus blue and then even green for for independence and things and then he had the idea to so superimpose the night 
the satellite nighttime. So you can see like each pixel of light probably represents a certain number of people or whatever, but you superimpose those maps and it's just stunning. I mean, this was years ago, so I haven't looked at it recently, but he did it all the way back to like the 2000 election. Um, things, so that's kind of where, those are kind of the two things I wanted to bring to people's attention. And I'll put a link in the in the chat. I see Kevin's hands up, but since he spoke already, I'll check in because I don't know if it's supposed to be up. Um, yeah, I have to run out soon. My refrigerator's dead, so I have to go buy it and give away my food. But I did want to check in and say that I was happy to hear Klaus mentioning the idea of colors, even though I don't know what the colors mean. I'm going to read the article, but it's sort of what I've been trying to talk about with tone for different audience. So I'm going to learn more about what the colors mean to you know people in academia. And the other thing I wanted to say is I was watching um, I was watching the chips hearing and I was listening to the Commerce Secretary and I was kind of I would I mean I was kind of happy to hear her speaking because I was hearing her trying to explain that they can accomplish goals and still do other things at the same time. And it was a kind of win-win thinking that I haven't heard before, at least in government. And maybe I'm naive, you know, maybe it's just because she's a woman, but I really felt that she had a different way of looking at things. And um, it made me feel, it made me feel hopeful. It made me feel hopeful. And Kevin, when Kevin mentioned um, interdisciplinary, you know, whatever, whatever rules had to be changed to allow for that, it sort of fit into the way this woman was thinking and how I always try to think locally, but don't necessarily know how to go about promoting that, for lack of a better word. So I just, I just like the way I have seen or it appears that the thinking has changed. That's that's my check-in. <laughs> Maybe the chat GPT summary can make it more, more articulate. <laughs> I don't have a check-in, but I have an idea for a different kind of check-in someday, um, where instead of uh, each of us speaking something about us, uh, we ask somebody else about uh, something that we know they know about. Just an idea. I think it would take a little bit of, of thought and, and care um, because you don't want it to be completely random, uh, but it might be fun. Is there anything that's completely random? David Bohm says something that happens once in the universe has a number of one.
I have a couple of things. I'll add. I haven't been here, been very infrequent, just because this time slot sometimes conflicts with things my wife and I are doing or how we arrange our lives. Um, one reason that I like to check in, like today, is I've learned an enormous amount about things that are worthy of my own attention. So I appreciate that quite a bit. One thing I have been doing is um, related to what uh, Douglas said. I've been reading some of what Doug gave me posting, which I really appreciate. Um, but also I've been doing a lot of reading of women philosophers, feminists, political theorists, and it actually is changing my whole way that I I'm making sense of things. Um, and the one thing that came up, I posted something from Jacqueline Rose in the chat, but she has written a book that she wrote during our ongoing pandemic called The Plague, Living Death in Our Times. She's British. And I just found it, it opened up to me something that to myself is really important about psychoanalysis, which as uh, the philosopher Martha Nussbaum mentioned, is something that uh, Americans aren't really very much interested in. They'd rather have a quick fix than to actually be sad. And so something that's come up for me is this, I think it was just mentioned about being aware of how the situation we're actually in right now and being able to have our feelings about that in addition to you know trying to take actions that you know seem helpful but i don't really have i mean i feel like uh that's what pete it's really a me problem i'm working on me here <laughs> and trying to be able to, you know, be better equipped to not be overwhelmed. Anyway, thank you all. There's uh, only a couple of us, couple of us who haven't checked in yet. So we're just about done with the check-in round. And I, I have a just a tiny check-in because check-ins are not meant to respond to other check-ins, but I'm resonating strongly with the sadness and grief uh, meme trope idea that that has shown up a couple times. And culturally, how Americans process or fail to process or intentionally avoid processing sadness and grief and things like that and the instant fix. And I'm also really interested in thresholds. There was a, there's a conversation, I'm on a list with a bunch of old telecom geeks and uh, it's the most conservative list I'm on. It has a bunch of people who are pretty far to the right. They're not MAGA crazy, but they're very conservative. And it's it's just interesting to watch the conversations go back and forth. And one guy was poo pooing like, "Gosh, everything sounds like climate change, like like a disaster. If, if this if this happened, if this weather even happened, it was because climate change. And won't they just stop?" And then a friend of some of ours, David Weinberger, who's on the same list and a very thoughtful author, asked, "So, what?" event would cause you to think climate change was real and th there's been no answer yet but but i'm really interested in that threshold like like what would have to happen because when when things just get worse and worse and worse slowly and slowly but they get worse to the point where numbers are really out of whack and if you go look at current reports september was the hottest month ever recorded uh it's it's like things are really out of whack in some way and i'm convinced but there's a whole mess of people out there who are not, and I don't know what has to happen in the world for them to go, oh, crap. Um, something is happening large enough, important enough that we might need to change behaviors, industrial structures, whatever else. <clears throat> and that that's sort of keeping us from getting any place in different ways. Um, hey, John, welcome to the call. We're doing a check-in round, and we're just about done. There's only a couple of people left to, to check in. Um, and that's it for me. I'm complete.
all summer long I've been trying to avoid doom and gloom because it's so easy to find here. But in, in the last, in this calendar year, I've been incredibly busy. For the last five months, I've been building some software that demonstrates the HCI issues that I've talked about over the years. And uh, it came to a boil at the beginning of July when uh, first off, my daughter got engaged. And then two days later, I incorporated New On Play LLC, which is the, the startup building software that I talked about. Uh, four days later, my son got engaged. And this is all while leading up to the big SIGGRAPH conference. Uh, it was in Plex that this year was the 50th, which I had to participate in two ways. Uh, one as assisting the current chair and the other as a contributor since I'm a longtime graphics team. And so this, uh, this brought up a, a lot of activity. The conference was in the beginning of August. At the same time, I also founded a nonprofit, the Center for Computer Graphics History, which is first off going to be about history, second be a resource, and second be and third be a topic for research. And that my ideas about accessing history are different than the way it's conventionally done. Um, and then uh, once SIGGRAPH was over, I had to start working on the design for next year's conference. So the last five months have been an incredible glut of activity. It's been fires all day long without pause. And I'm feeling kind of refreshed because it's all creative. I know something happened in the U.S. House of Representatives. Well, I know pretty much what happened, but I'm just staying away from it. I want to create instead of be morose. So. I think John, who else? Ken, did you go? Yep. Um, so John, if you'd like to um, check in, I don't. I think we've got everybody else, and then we can head into conversation space. Uh, one uh, clarification from the, the chat uh, is um, I'm not doing what's currently called UI, UX, or HCI or anything like that because uh, I have completely redefined what the notion is. I'm going to have to come up with a new term because all of the current terms are polluted. Uh, this sounds like a, a little topic we could maybe be helpful with. Uh, so hold that thought. Yeah. It's... Uh, go ahead. Okay. John. Thank you. Well, I, I, I'm going to ask for just a minute here. I'm, I'm yeah, don't don't hit car. anybody while talking to us. Right. right. No, I'm, I'm just going to look for a, a pullover spot. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Here we go. Pullover spot. Great. Okay. So, yeah, I, I feel... Um, can you, John? Can you turn your video, with this group? Even you, though, can you turn your video back off? You were your sure. audio was clipping a lot, and if you turn the video off, the audio should be okay. Clear. Let me. I'll turn the video off. Just a sec here. Thanks. Go for it. Okay, is, is that better? Yes. So yeah, I it's 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 interesting to come back into this group as intermittently. But it feels more. Um, like coming home than than I would have guessed it would. You know, there's something about the there's a there is a continuity here, even though this the whole group is very meta and everybody is <laughs> very capable of, of taking it off these great conceptual ski jumps. Um it still feels very much like, oh yes, I know this group. <laughs> I see where we're going. Okay, so um what I've been up to is um, I've been a little bit focused on the harms and potential benefits of uh, AI and more specifically the large language models and working on a pretty long and pretty complicated scenario for how that could play out uh, fictionally. And I'm integrating that scenario with Uh, we just lost your audio, John. Oh, John just fell off the call. Yeah, he's got pissed off. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, oh, this guy's oh. working on stuff that's dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Did I come back? Yes. Am I back? I saw, yeah. I got, okay, great. I got, 
got a message, you know, I'm reconnecting. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm writing about a safe civilization team that's very diverse and that has um, personality AIs supporting it. And the personality AIs are um, associated with, with famous historical figures like uh, Eschelus and um, Hedy Lamar <laughs> and, and some others, some indigenous folks as well. So it's a lot of fun. It's a big challenge. Um, I recently sent something to you, Jerry, about the whole question of harms and benefits. Um, and uh, so that's a, that's a big, big question. And that, that's whether you think of it as being on your plate or not, it's, it's right here. It's present. It's, it's alive and uh, it will, it will come into our lives. It is coming into our lives in, uh, in important ways. So uh, I, and I know I've got a sketchy connection here, so maybe that's enough for me as a check-in. That's, that's what I'm up to uh, really appreciating this group. And I suspect there are people here who will have a lot to, uh, could, could contribute a lot to my thinking. And I look forward uh, connecting with you individually uh, you know, uh, Jerry and Pete and others uh, about that. Okay. I suppose. Thank you, John. Thanks very much. That worked out. That worked out. Uh, technology is our friend today. Uh, we are now in conversational mode. Uh, Kevin, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> this is uh, in response to Dave Witzel. Uh, in my experience, open source is, is pretty expensive, uh, you know, to actually get it to the point where you can share it. And in, in the work I do, we're really looking a lot at replicability. You know, uh, there's like a fund that does down payments for folks who are at risk of displacement in Colorado that we're working with a guy that <clears throat> to he's and we're just highlighting that they're replicating it in Austin and San Antonio. Uh, coming out of saving circle and replicability is really important but it's really hard I, I was interviewing somebody yesterday who's built the best local investing exchange in the country uh it's in maryland the maryland neighborhood exchange and she's totally supported by philanthropy and she can't afford to come to the conference to talk about something that should be replicated so i'm saying look We'll do a GoFundMe. I'll put up 500 bucks. We need you there. But the folks who are doing these things don't have the money to explain to other folks how to replicate them. And there's so many one-off sorts of things. I, I've got a whole uh, I got a newsletter out. And so many things that are, <clears throat> there's one of these and there should be a bunch, you know, from the food system bank in Connecticut to uh, uh, Michigan doing a uh, credit on your local taxes of $3,000. You get half of that back if you invest in local businesses. And none of those are stitched together at all. And replicability is really, uh, it, it takes lots of things to get it going once. And everybody forgets that, you know, there's this community entrepreneur that's stitching the whole ecosystem together. And that's really hard, but the solution actually works. And so it's, I'm, I'm just really stuck on, on replicability. I, I, I'm, I'm skeptical of open source because I've been around a couple of things and keeping everything ready to be put out there is, is high cost. And I, maybe I should talk to you offline, Dave, but I'm, it, the, the stuff I'm seeing, there's a bunch of things that are one-offs that should be done other places. So that's just Kevin, that. Kevin are, you, are you kind of asking how could we reduce the costs or overhead of replicability? I think that's what I'm, yeah, yeah, uh, yes. And, and, and a lot of the costs are these soft knitting together. You know, this woman, Stephanie Geller, goes from meeting to meeting all over Baltimore, you know, and uh, it, it can't afford a plane flight, you know, but she's really, she's made, you know, almost $6 million go to 250 mostly uh, businesses of color uh, through 10,000 people investing. So it's, it clearly can be done. But nobody pays for the, you know, the social entrepreneur doing the good is, 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 is barely sustainable. <clears throat> and yet what she's done should, could, could and should be done so many places. 
that's just where does I'm she stuck. have a does she have a patreon page or any any other patronage model I, website i yeah i, I you know I, I i'm trying to get a gofundme to get her to come into the room where we have a bunch of foundations who would love it but she can't mm -hmm. afford a flight so that's uh you know, th this is not a Patreon problem. This is this is a foundation. See the see the solution and get help it get bigger. Problem. I mean, Patreon is okay, but people do five bucks. I mean, you know, you might get five hundred or a thousand uh, a month, and mm -hmm. and you have to work it. And the cost of Patreon is is uh, you, you know it it, it 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 gets you to beans, but not pork. You know, ramen, but not whatever. Um, yeah. Exactly. Uh, Thanks, Kevin. Klaus? Yeah, I, it, I just did the um, community event here in Bend because I've been you know, working for some time to transfer what, what I've been doing for these for national groups like Business Climate Leader and Sierra Club and so on to do that at a local level. Um, and the the um, so what I wanted to really do is a form of focus group research that um, that highlights the core issues uh, at community level. So what uh, what do we here in Bend need to advance our agricultural system, our food system, you know, base of pyramid uh, uh, opportunity, access to food, access to shelter, and so on. Um, we had a county commissioner joining because we made enough noise uh, you know, around it with Citizen Climate Lobby. We had uh, members from city council, Senator Merkley, uh, Lois uh, Chavez, who is a member of a Republican member of the uh, uh, House Agricultural Committee, sent their staffers to it. Uh, the room was packed. Mm -hmm. And we had just a really good local team, you know, directive of the local school system, food, um, the neighborhood impact uh, person responsible for feeding, you know, uh, disadvantaged uh, children, families. So, so now um, we and we had a videographer come in and record the event. You know, we started out with the Kiss the Ground forty-five minute uh, short version of the film that explains what's happening in nature and you know, on the soil and how this all, how the water cycle interacts and so on. So I've been looking through the uh, the, the video, and, and Pete, I'm going to, uh, if you can't publish it yet, I'll be still going through some processes here, but uh, the, the, the data uh, that came out of this conversation is amazing. You know, the, the uh, um, I mean, all these uh, um, point, these punctures, you know, the, the, that, that you see that we don't have any meat processing capacity, we don't, uh, we, we lack fan funding sources for the WIC program and so on and so on. And anyway, the the uh, I I think you really need to go community by community. You know, the, this is uh, because each community has different dynamics, different uh, different players. You know, uh, and you don't know where they are. You know, you can go to the Sierra Club in one community and they're on fire, and then you go to the next community and all they want to do is nature walks. Now, and and so you you can't go through centralized organizations. You have to build it from the ground on up and find what I call now sort of a coalition of the willing. You know, you get people who get it. We found a young lady who is a farm who started as a farmer. Um, she is totally on fire. I mean, she has she's smart. You know, she has uh, amazing amount of energy uh, and, and great ideas. You know, and so. You know, we, we can use we can work with her to team her up with you know, a couple other uh, people who are working as a grant writer. You know, there is uh, the Soil and Water Conservation District in one area. It's a wonderful person. So, so it really comes down to developing a process structure. You know that 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 works at community level to bring players together and engages the community, which is why these kind of panel discussions are really helpful because you're bringing in the community. Now you, you, you're bringing in the, the, the most important decision makers like the county commissioner got really uh, uh, animated in the meeting. He got really engaged, you know, and we had some discussions where, for example, we found out that in Deschutes County, we don't fund the Soil and Water Conservation District for whatever mysterious reason. <laughs> you know, they just, they basically don't know what that is and how it works and what it's supposed to do. 
So I think it, whereas in some other counties, you know, I mean, I was uh, working up at the Palouse and they just put $10 million into their soil and water conservation district. You know, so you have these differences, which are so community specific uh, that, so, so anyway, long story. So I'm, I think more than software, you know, and developing com fancy communication tools, it's a process that we have to engage in. And after that, it doesn't matter whether you work with an Excel spreadsheet or whatever, uh, uh, websites you want to do. It's just basically getting the data together. Thanks, Klaus. Uh, Ken, then Dave. I want to go back to something you said about Dave Weinberger's question of what would it take for you to, did you say, what would it take for you to believe climate change is real? Is that what the question was? No, I'm paraphrasing, but yeah. Yeah, um, I'm reading Monica Guzman's book, which I highly recommend. She's one of the founders of Bravery Angels. As the book is called, I never thought of it that way. And that question is loaded as in, I'm going to convince you. I'm trying to convince you with climate change is real. So it's a it's a bad way in. Um, probably close to 10 years ago, Reuters did a, uh, a series on uh, climate change, but they didn't mention climate change. They just used tidal indicators, which have been around for hundreds of years people have been marking where tides are and uh this is when the tea party was really big and and there's a uh chesapeake bay has seen some of the highest levels of sea level rise on the east coast and so there's a woman who's a county supervisor standing at the edge of her dock saying i don't believe in climate change but i have to admit my dock is underwater and it's never been underwater before and so i think a better approach would be to not say um uh, you know, what will it take to convince you that this is real, but to say, you know, what do you think is going on? How do you account for the fact that your dock is underwater? And really be in a curious space to try and understand the other person before attempting to convince them that your position is right and that climate change is real. Because there are people out there, some of whom you'll never reach. They're just, they're they're in denial. So you're not going to crack it. But there's a lot of people who really aren't sure. And they, they, you know, if they're given the opportunity to actually be in a conversation where you're curious about that and understanding, and Guzman talks a lot about the, about stories, um, you know, how stories really are what change people that um, if you don't know where people have been, where, where they're coming from, uh, if you don't know their story, then facts are never going to change their mind. And um, she tells some great stories, you know, her, her, she says, my mother is, uh, Mexican Catholic, which is its own thing. And one day in Boston, she saw a couple walking in front of her and she realized it was actually a male couple. And um, one of them leaned over and kissed the other one. And she had been up to that point adamantly against homosexuality. And she said, I recognized that it was the same kind of kiss your father gives to me. It was love. It was just love. It was so normal. And all of a sudden, she she released her story of the church teachings around homosexuality to see this is two people who love each other and that's a beautiful thing and that changed her and you know so i think when we come into conversations with the i'm right uh climate change is happening whatever it is you think is going on and, and you're wrong then we're we're really setting ourselves up for failure and setting ourselves up for a deeper argument rather than how can we be engaged with people whether we change their mind or not just to hear their side of things and you know, maybe after five or 10 or 100 conversations with curious people, they start to go, hmm, maybe, maybe I'm, uh, maybe I got something to learn here. Maybe I'm not right. Maybe there's, there's some other way. So I'm just really enjoying this book and finding a lot of value in, in her approach of be curious, be curious, be curious. Do not let your assumptions get in the way. Do not let your, don't argue for your point of view. Try to understand the other person first, which goes to Stephen Covey's seek first to understand before attempting to be understood. So just thought I'd throw that in there. Thanks, Ken. That's really helpful. Um, Dave? And maybe we should do a special session sharing everything we know and think and suspect and fear about storytelling and narrative. And that would be a really good use of our time is because I, I, I agree very much that narrative is, is like huge, really important here. And the more, the, the better we can get at it, the better our chances of figuring stuff out. Go ahead, Dave. Hey, and Jerry, on that one, if, if you were in the, ever in the mood to do like a cross network call or something i'd love to to invite the goc folks to that for example yeah sounds Maybe great do a, do a plexi call or something like that plexi call uh, 
Um, yeah, and I guess, I mean, I was just going to think, I was kind of responding to Kevin, and I guess he just dropped off, but uh, Carl, thanks a lot for the link. I'll, I'll follow up on that. But I guess, so one of the intuitions I've been having is, and I'd love to see if anybody else shares it, is that in some sense, if you think about, well, and we have to do things near in near term and, and in far term, we don't get to choose one or the other, we have to do both, right? And um, the, the part of the value of the open sourcey concept is that the as we, it's, it's compounded interest, right? It's like, we need the assets that upon which the society grows to be shared, not, not proprietary, right? That's one of the issues that we need to deal with as we're going forwards. And so if we're going to kind of create a new regenerative future, we want the assets that drive that regenerative future to be held in the commons. And those are, they're, they're not open, they're not, they're software, but they're also data and they're legal contracts and there's curriculum. I mean, it's all of the intellectual assets, everything that has zero marginal cost of distribution, right? Ought to be held in the commons and not be captured for extraction by rich people who can manipulate IP. Um, and so I guess that I'm a little bit, that's a little bit of a theory, but it's if we were to, and, and, the, and the internet, I think demonstrates that model, right? Most of the, a huge chunk of the core of the internet is, is in the commons and it has allowed wide distribution of, of, of you know, uh, people, jobs and it's global, right? We've had a global impact on employment by opening up the source of the internet um, and so we've transformed economies all over the world. Um, and so, yeah, chunks of it have still been captured, but a big chunk of it hasn't. And we also have enabled amazing capacity. I mean, we can, you know, you can launch an open AI on top of this massive stack that we've built over the last 30 years. Um, and anyway, so I'm just curious if anybody else resonates with this notion that we need a, an intellectual core, a big, a big open source bank account, essentially, that, you know, we're, that, we're, that, we're, that we're capturing interest off of, and that ought to be, you know, publicly held. Uh, Pete, whenever you makes it in. Thanks, Jay. Um, Dave, that makes a, a ton of sense, and it's well explained too. It, it explains um, a, a lot of times people don't uh, don't think of in terms of um, financial realities and and uh, assets and and compound interest and stuff like that, uh, and and with open source, but um, but it's a good way to think about it, and and I think important. Um, and, uh, I like Ken, uh, and Ken, thank you so much for talking about stories. Um, I, I kind of, I'm intrigued by, uh, Jerry, your conveyance of David Weinberger's, you know, question, um, what would it take to convince you that climate change is real? And I think there's one of the, um, a, a lot of us who grew up in, with a scientific education, take for granted that you can predict things. Um, and I think another thing that we do is take for granted that predictions like that are obviously, to me, they're, they're obviously imprecise. Um, so, you know, so 30 or 40 years ago, when scientists started to say, you know, I think there's going to be a problem here. I think this is what's going to happen. And they would get a question or an argument. Um, and they would say, well, I don't know. It's going to be between this range and that range. Um, for a lot of people who haven't had a scientific education, that means that they don't know what they're talking about rather than they do know what they're talking about. So I... I, I am not saying that we should not do science, and I'm, I'm especially not saying that we should not do predictions. I definitely think that we should. But I think a lot of us, me included, walk around with kind of the, you know, hey, I've looked at the evidence. I've seen the, I've seen the, um, the trend lines. I kind of can know, I, I can tell you what's going to happen. <clears throat> That's... I, that's not a particularly human thing to do. Humans don't work that way. Humans haven't worked that way for you know tens of thousands of years. Um, I, I love your I love your uh, your hands, Jerry. I you know uh, obviously we've you know humanity has made a ton of progress by doing science um, and by um, 
by predicting and things like that. Um, and yet, uh, if I think about a lot of humanity, I don't know, like 80% or something like that, they work on stories and religion and tribalism and connections to your neighbors and, you know, positive connections to your neighbors and negative connections to your neighbors. And the, the whole, you know, you can predict your way out of this thing, or you can predict what's going to happen is, is, I, I think it's a challenging thing and it's not obvious and it's less obvious than I think to those of us to whom it is, is obvious. So I, I think another, another component of meeting people where they are with climate change is to talk about what's happening now, you know, how's your peer doing and is it underwater and what would you do about that, you know? Um, and I think you could step from there into a little bit of, of what we would call scenario planning you know, hey, I'm not saying it's going to happen necessarily, but you know, what if what if this land got a lot drier? Um, you know, what would what would happen? You know, not just not not saying that it would, but you know, what would we want to do in that case? Maybe and maybe we should think about doing something like that just in case, rather than you have to do it now because otherwise everything is you know, there's a there ends up being um, a component of what I think is perceived by most many people maybe not most people maybe most people um, there's a component of of what is perceived as alarmism um, and and in our gener maybe the past couple of generations the past couple of generations we've weaponized. Um, uh, people have weaponized, not necessarily scientists, but people have weaponized predictions and and um, illusions, illusory statements. Um, our dear departed uh, uh, Mr. Trump uh, was was spectacular um, at um, weaponizing, you know, the the ability to say something that that had no basis in fact, as if it were something to rally around. Um, uh, and so we get into these arguments like, well, I, or if, it feels like it's an argument, right? I want to tell you something true. <laughs> you know, I know this to be true because I did the science, you know, and it's like, really? That's what you're going to argue with somebody about, you know? Um, I, I, they're, they're, we, we need to have a lot more connection. And we have a, a, I think we need to have a lot more empathy for people to whom the science is not an intuitively obvious answer to things even even if it is an intuitively obvious answer to to me for instance you know i've i've worked up you know through my education to to be able to hear a scientist and go well okay let me check their you know let me check her calculations and her predictions and her her um her background and yeah i i believe that i that's that's a, a, a very tempting way to believe in things that folks around here, you know, are native to, and it's anti-native to a lot of people. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. Um, I'm gonna sprinkle like four or five different things in here in response to some of what we've been saying. <clears throat> Partly, Pete, I, I did the uh, uh, around people don't, predictor or we're not good predictors in the sense of I think this is in dawn of everything as well in that um, we needed to say hey about this time is next year is when the fish are going to run and and it, we you know if we sprinkle seeds here I predict that they'll grow up and we'll be able to harvest them next year when we come by this area and by the way the, the kangaroos really like this kind of plant we should just enhance the this kind of plant near this forest where the kangaroos hang out etc and and I think there was a lot of that that helped us thrive and, and figure things out really well. And hence, everybody trying to do astronomy, you know, the, the, the Mayans and Aztecs doing astronomy and all that, <laughs> the, or, or, the, uh, or ancient Egypt. Like the, the people who predicted when the, when the Nile was going to flood were really important people in society. Um, I don't know if they were that good. And then there's a whole bunch of research that seems to be kind of resonating inward to itself on how the brain is a prediction engine. And that resonates really well with how LLMs work because it's busy predicting what the next most sensible word might be. And I'm sensing some kind of very interesting convergence there of a bunch of a bunch of different things. Uh, so that that's a uh, one little bucket of things. Uh, then, uh, 
it's this is going to sound weird coming from me, but while I appreciate more appropriate ways of gently entering conversations and all that, isn't the house on fucking fire? And isn't this an emergency? And how do we get people to take dramatic action, which is what Doug uh, C is trying to get us to do forever, um, by gently walking into a situation, which is a piece of the argument. The other piece is that sometimes some of these people actually will only listen to people who have balls and bluster and tell a crazy ass story. And some of the stories that are floating that are belief systems now are that Democrats drink the blood of young people as a fountain of youth and a whole bunch of other kinds of things. There are seriously crazy ass stories that QAnon propagates because they work. <clears throat> and 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 once you're in a cult like that, there we've had a couple of little conversations about sort of what happens to cults and cult deprogramming. Like when predictions, when cult predictions don't happen, the cults double down. The people don't leave cults easily. So uh, I, I'm I'm afraid that that by talking about all these things, I'm just realizing how crazy the situation is and how difficult it is to actually break free. Because we can try to approach people by saying, hey, your feet are wet on the dock. Could that lead to something? And that might open the conversation. It might also be that we're showing up with the wrong story and it's not crazy enough or the deliverer of the story isn't manic or ballsy enough or I don't know what. I'm just concerned that we're spinning uh, madly in, you know, like, like in a, in a Mexican standoff, it's like, it's like a knife fight in the, in, in an elevator. That's what Congress feels like right now. Um, and we have a lot of uh, things we could do together very nicely that wouldn't bring about crisis that would actually fix things that would like, like improve communities and, uh, settle in the climate and other kinds of things. There's plenty of work to do. It'd be happy work. It would create full employment, blah, 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 blah. So I'm frustrated because I I wish I understood better which method will have the most results to be really like uh, you know best results for the most people kind of kind of thing. Uh, Judy then Pete. Utilitarian, I think is the right word. Sorry, I had to unmute. Yep. Um, <clears throat> I I think I guess I'm. I'm intrigued by the conversation today that's really around, in my mind, how to get people to openly think and converse with each other, share opinions and intake changes that they may be insensitive to or not wanting to cope with. And I think that would be worth a discussion separately as a topic. It's around sort of communication, understanding, and influence, or something like that. Um, because I find that a lot of people aren't interested in facts at all, and they're influenced most by what the people they respect think. <laughs> and so that's a that's a social dynamic that we can learn to use. But it bothers me that people aren't wanting to do the homework of thinking about stuff or aren't accustomed to doing that. I don't, don't know that they don't want to, but it has a lot to do with how we intake information. And I think this is a pretty rich area that would probably be of broad interest and worth some deeper diving. Thanks, Judy, I agree. Thanks, Judy. Well, my thanks to all of you, because you're all people who read, learn, think, listen, and share. <laughs> we're trying. Um, Jay, I wanted to pick up uh, where you were talking about uh, humans uh, in the past, um, you know, uh, learning to predict and surviving thereby. You know, the fish are going to run this time, or the kangaroos like these kinds of plants or whatever. Um, uh, and I want to do a bit of a thought experiment around that. Um, so one of the interesting things about, and, and you know, obviously, I, I think a lot, of, a lot of our ancestors survived that way. Um, so we, you know, theoretically, we humans have the ability to not only 
like observe over the course of years and then learn to predict things and then then learn to transmit those predictions down through time in stories or uh, grandma says, you know, whatever, um, however that happens. Um, I, I guess I have a, a bit of a, um, I, I'm trying not to say contrarian. Uh, I have a, a, a bit of a, a uh, one of the things I like to do is like, what, what if it was different? Um, you know, what if the story was different? So um, if, um, if I'm thinking back to how humans survived over the past 100,000 years, uh, one story is that, well, we got better and better in predicting you know, the future, uh, learning what animals were where, when, things like that. Uh, a different story I could tell in a contrarian way, and maybe this is true and maybe it's not, maybe the truth is actually someplace in the middle. A different story is what if humans are really good at um, uh, coming up with crazy ass theories about things and, um, and sticking to them like glue. Uh, so in this scenario, what happened over the past 100,000 years is, you know, out of uh, 10 or 20 or, or 100 uh, tribal groups in Africa, large family groups, tribal groups, 80% um, uh, of them died out because what happened was humans were really good at coming up with crazy ass predictions and transmitting them to their, their offspring. Uh, and, um, and in most cases, they were stupid, right? I predict that there's going to be a herd of wildebeest coming through here every year for the next, you know, a thousand years or something like that. And, you know, next year, no wildebeest, the year after that, uh, it is my crazy ass theory. Um, and so, you know, these people who were gathered around whatever natural phenomenon that was predicted by the shamans um, end up starving to death and that, that branch dies out. Um, I think I could make a pretty convincing argument that this evolutionary strategy um, of exploring a lot of spaces and having most of those die horrible deaths because they starve to death or because they're in the wrong place when there is a wildebeest stampede and they all get run over or something like that. Maybe humanity survived because of its ability to diversify and, and have cults that uh, mostly died. So I think, you know, um, uh, this is kind of like, um, uh, I'm looking at his, at his name right now. Uh, there's this, uh, the survivorship bias uh, guy, uh, Waldman, I think. Um, he's like, you know, the reason that we think these things happen is because these are the ones that are survived. What we're not looking at is all the ones that didn't survive. So just a kind of a, a different way to think about why we see the behavior that we do now. Um, maybe this is evolutionarily really appropriate behavior, even though it's maddlingly frustrating uh, when we've gotten to the point at, you know, where we can use our computers and math and stuff like that to actually, and, and a lot of scientific um, process to kind of winnow out the things that are crazy and the things that aren't. Maybe that's not the way humanity survived. Um, and maybe a big part of our challenge now is learning how to cope with the, the ability for humans to believe crazy stuff. Can I accommodate your theory to my theory a little bit and see if you agree? Um, yes, there, I love the thesis from Dawn of Everything that we've tried whole, a whole bunch of experiments all over the place. That makes complete sense. It's great. And it beats the narratives of life was nasty, brutish, and short, and then we invented civilization. So I'm completely on board with that. And a lot of tribes created like were Darwin Award winners and basically extincted themselves by being stupid and doing stupid stuff, including embedding really stupid ideas like female genital mutilation into the culture, which they replicated over and over and over and forced people to do and became so embedded in the culture, you couldn't be in the culture unless you participated in stupid behavior. Um, but a, a, a bunch of communities figured stuff out. And what they figured out was derived wisdom, indigenous wisdom, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> and they passed that down through song lines, through stories, through narratives, through weaving, through however it was they passed their, their cultural narrative to the next generation. And that stuff 
included a whole bunch of predictions and usefulness. And if you go into the forest and you see a plant that looks like this, it's really good for headaches or whatever, right? All of that stuff was was what they figured out. And I call this hard won wisdom. So I put a link in the in the chat to my brain on on hard won wisdom. Um, and I think that's not incommensurate. I think that those things fit together really well. It's like, uh, you know, being stupid about how the world works is what helps you extinct yourself more quickly. But when you figure stuff out, that helps you predict. No? Yeah. Um, makes perfect sense. And they're, they're, um, they accommodate well together. The, the point I was trying to make was that it, I, I think we get frustrated. Um, we who think we know everything uh, get frustrated when we see people who stick to beliefs because some masterful uh, shaman told them that rather than believing their own eyes, even, you know, they'll, they'll believe a masterful shaman over the, the evidence of their own family or their own lived experience. So I, I think those of us who think we know everything look at, at, people who are believing crazy stuff like they're stupid um, or like all we have to do is tell them a little bit better. Um, what if uh, humans survived as well as we had because one of our core strengths is telling each other crazy stories and believing them? What if that's so deeply ingrained in us that you don't get rid of it by telling better stories or by um, you know, and, and so, you know, right now, 80% of the world population maybe is the, on the path of, you know, certain destruction, you know, maybe that has happened before and that's the way it works. Um, you know, and what, I don't know what we do, you know, those of us who think we know everything, I don't know what we do in that case, but, um, it's, it, it may be an extreme evolutionary advantage that we have to believe bullshit. I have I have two survivorship stories I wanted to relate real quick. One of them is uh, where I live in California and probably where everybody lives. But where I live in California, there's this plant called poison oak. Um, and if you wander around um, in uh, in nature long enough, you'll traipse through uh, a patch of poison oak. And many of us European descendants uh, get these nasty, terrible rashes um, that would that would kill you if you didn't have like good medical uh, care. Um, and, you know, and then there's stories from hundreds of years ago where the, the native folk here uh, used the same plants. They used the nice, strong uh, stems uh, to, to make baskets and, you know, stuff like that. And I, I kind of put those two things together. You know, it's like, I think probably the first people who ever came here, um, you know, 20 or 30 percent of them had nasty allergies to uh, Ushral and <laughs> and died, you know? <laughs> so uh, I, the, the immunity that uh, the native people have to poison oak is, is a hard one thing. And it wasn't won by, you know, indigenous wisdom even. It was a bunch of people died who were, were uh, you know, not, not immune to it. The other survivorship story I, I, I find really fascinating is um, at some point in the last few hundred years, people realized that in South America, there's a, there was this thing called maize growing corn. Um, and it was, you know, bountiful, uh, easily multiplying uh, crop. And it had lots of, like lots of calories. Uh, so they imported this corn uh, maize over to, to Italy and people started eating it. And the poor people started eating mostly corn. And then they started dying from niacin deficiency because if you don't do some really tricky, like unobvious things when you're preparing corn, uh, you don't get uh, the vitamin B2 out of it. Uh, and so you go back to South America and it turns out that the, the native people there had learned over time that, you know, you, you have to grind it up and then you have to soak in a certain, you know, certain chemicals for a while and stuff like that and cook it a certain way. And then you get enough um, nutrition out of it to, to survive. And this, again, it's like this, you know, partly it's indigenous wisdom, partly it's the, the families that did, you know, grandma had this weird way of making corn and I don't know why she did it, but she said, you have to do it this way. The families who didn't have that familiar tradition of, of preparing corn in a certain way got weaker and died, <laughs> you know? So, 
um, a lot of a lot of our wisdom, I think, is is actually genetically one as as well as intellectually one. Klaus and Julian, thank you for your patience. Go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, along the same vein, the Arab uh, cultures were leading in math and science uh, for uh, quite quite a while, very accomplished until Prophet Muhammad declared uh, a, a math, calculating math, uh, witchcraft, which ended uh, that entire era. So it's just one story like this wiped out you know, an entire civilization's progress. But what I wanted to <clears throat> So in here is I've been working for maybe like seven years or so now with lobbying organizations, you know, different ones, Sierra Club, CCL, and so on, and and went to Washington several times and local and and talked with legislators and what have you. And I mean, I must say it's just shocking, you know, the amount of ignorance and and lack of uh, uh, even basic comprehension of science and. The, the the shocking you know lack of acceptance of of what is scientific knowledge uh manipulating it instead and at this time um we are so at risk you know of um having literally trillions billions trillions of dollars allocated to run this economy into the wrong direction and 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 really finish it off it's just spectacular and the average citizen is just not aware of it. I mean, you just don't think about that people who are making decisions for all of us are basically very ignorant, you know, in, in, uh, and, and not just that they're ignorant, they are, they are willfully ignorant, you know, about uh, rejecting uh, uh, what uh, should be best available course, you know, and so on and so on. So I, I keep I keep saying engage. You know, it, it's it's uh, uh, you can't ignore this. And, and I know it's like you know most people's eyes glaze over when I mean, you say you should call your representative. You should be known to your senator. You should be you know, a voice out there. Um, but boy, it's, it's uh, our collective future. It really depends on it. You, know? you would be amazed some of the conversations that I've had. You know, it's it's just stunning, and and so yeah. Sorry, it's just more bad news here. Right? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right, Klaus. We're sympathetic. <laughs> uh, three quick comments. One from Pete. Uh, I've done extensive research on poison oak since I'm one of those people you talked about. And I found out that it's very easily neutralized. So it could be that the natives discovered the neutralization process instead of killing themselves off. Uh, second is along the themes of natural selection. What Klaus was just saying is that thanks to modern technology, those people who were too stupid to survive by themselves back in the past, nowadays with things like bombs and pollution and all that stuff, when they're too stupid to survive by themselves, they take out the next 10 valleys with them, or maybe even the next 100 valleys. So this is a different circumstance than we faced a million years ago. And then third, the thing about traditions, there's the old joke about somebody who was preparing a roast and to cut off the last three inches of the roast before putting in the oven. Does everybody know that joke? So, yeah, okay. And that's on the theme of uh, passing knowledge along. So. And some wisdom is encoded really weird and in, in strange ways. Um, in the book, Perfect Order about Bali, um, the writer talks about how uh, the Green Revolution came to Bali, almost killed off not only rice farming on Bali, but the reefs offshore because fertilizer and crap came out and created blooms and all that. They sent an anthropologist who figured out that the thousand year old rituals that were being perform performed in the water temples in the Subaks, which are the little districts that were managing water coming off the mountain, incorporated algorithms for how whose field should lie fallow when, how much water each person, each farmer should get, et cetera, et cetera. But they were encoded in ritual. And it took them a while to figure out that that this was hard won wisdom that was baked into uh, arcane uh, process that that had to be decoded, I guess. And and that's my best memory of the of the story. We have run over time. Ken is luckily still here, and I'm willing to bet he has a lovely poem for us again today. And I'm going to see if he would like to step in and, and do that. I, I do and I will, but I need to know from Julian, how do you neutralize poison oak? This is an important question since I live in Marin County. 
Uh, all right, I was just typing it in. Erushiol is acidic, so it's neutralized with a base. The easiest way to find a base these days is a soap, not the chemistry lab stuff like Dove or Irish Spring, but a, a soap that's uh, just simple soap. Like and you lye. Pick it out. Uh, lye? Well, yeah, although that's pretty extreme. <laughs> and you only get about two hours before the Erushiol gets under your skin, and then you're stuck. So. All right, thank you. Good to know. And I have field tested this a, a few times, so. So I, I um, this poem's come to mind several times this week, so I thought I'd read it today. It's a Rumi poem. It's called The Snake Catcher and the Frozen Snake. Listen to this and hear the mystery inside. A snake catcher went into the mountains to find a snake. He wanted a friendly pet and one that would amaze audiences, but he was looking for a reptile, something that has no knowledge of friendship. It was winter. In the deep snow, he saw a frighteningly large dead snake. He was afraid to touch it, but he did. In fact, he dragged the thing back to Baghdad, hoping people would pay to see it. This is how foolish we've become. A human being is a mountain range. Snakes are fascinated by us. Yet we sell ourselves to look at a dead snake. We are like a beautiful satin used to patch burlap. Come, see the dragon I killed and hear the adventures. That's what he announced, and a large crowd came. But the dragon was not dead, just dormant. He set up show at the crossroads. A ring of gawking rubes got thicker and thicker. Everybody on tiptoe, men, women, noble, peasant, all packed together, unconscious of their differences. It was like the resurrection. He began to unwind the thick ropes and remove the cloth coverings he'd wrapped it so well in. Some little movement. The hot Iraqi sun had woken the terrible life. The people nearest started screaming. Panic! The dragon tore easily and hungry loose, killing many instantly. The snake catcher stood there frozen. What have I brought out of the mountains? The snake braced against a post and crushed the man and consumed him. The snake is your animal soul. When you bring it into the hot air of your wanting energy, warmed by that and the prospect of power and wealth, it does massive damage. Leave it in the snow mountains. Don't expect to oppose it with quietness and sweetness and wishing. The nafs don't respond to those. They can't be killed. It takes a Moses to deal with such a beast and to lead it back and make it lie down in the snow. But there was no Moses then. Hundreds of thousands died. And thank you. Uh, can you share a link to that either in the chat or later on? Um... Yeah, I'll have to signify. It's, it's from this wonderful book by Robert Bly, edited by Robert Bly, called The Soul is Here for Its Own Joy, which has oh, cool. poems from Mirabai and, and Kabir and Rumi, as well as himself, and Machado and Hopkins and Dickinson. It's 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 a terrific anthology, uh, sacred poems from many cultures. Uh, it's it, If you like poetry, it belongs on your shelf. Love that. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, thank you all. This was fun. Um, I'm tentatively booking next Thursday for a call to share our best wisdom on narrative, storytelling, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So let's let's go for that as a topic, and we can do a little homework between now and then. And otherwise, nice to see everybody. When are we going to get back to music? That was an awesome call. Music was good. So maybe we do music after that. All right. And if, if you've upgraded to Sonoma, you get um, a bunch of automatic gestures in video, which are kind of cool. You upgrade to a point zero. I always wait for point one, man. <laughs> it's working. It's working. Um, thank you all. And uh, Carl, thanks for recommending uh, pinning uh, Ken while he was reading. That was a good idea. I will try to remember that. John, good to see you stationary. Enjoy your meal. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Ciao. Bye, everybody.